Hello and welcome to episode 10 in the IdeaCast interview series. Today I'm psyched to present Carrie Lynn Miller. She's an accomplished and talented actress, amazing producer, and now director of a feature-length film called Awaken Her. And this film is in development. We're going to talk about the theme of the film, the inspiration behind the film, and it covers some terrain that I think is very relevant in in today's social media saturated world, especially with young people and more especially with young women. So it's an important conversation, but it's also an exciting conversation in that Carrie Lynn is developing this film as we speak. And so we discuss how people can get invested in this project of hers, this film that is going to be an amazing cautionary tale, a surreal psychological thriller that will leave an impression upon people, but it will also open up conversations and narratives that need to be brought forward and discussed. So join me as Carrie Lynn and myself sit down and have, again, uh, an informative and important conversation, but it's also entertaining. We have a lot of fun, and I know you'll feel that when we have this discussion. So enjoy this interview, and thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to welcome Carrie Lynn Miller to the IdeaCast interview series. Carrie, it's an honor to have you on board, and I can't wait to have a, uh, a amazing conversation with you about what you're doing and what's going on in your life. So welcome. Glad to have you on board. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you, Justin. This is great. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to have um, both a, a, a sort of an inquiry into your work, but also we're going to, uh, I, I want to see that expand out, and, and I, I I envision an audience for us that's going to uh, be coming here because of things like perfectionism and body dysmorphia and things like that. We, you know, we're going to get into some really neat content that uh, I think there'll be some good takeaways for um, young women, women uh, in my age range and, and so forth. And oh, there's my cat showing up on the shot. So we're going to have an auspicious interview because the cats are out. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking over like, what is that? <laughs> so, anyway, awaken her is emerging and it is, uh, I, from what I've seen, uh, is going to be uh, an amazing uh, production. And also I um, will offer to put the, uh, the uh, pitch video in if you want. I can grab the screen and we can do the pitch video if you want, or we can talk through it uh, about what's going on and what, where you're at right now. So why don't, you, why don't you let us know about Awaken Her? And if you want me to put up the pitch video, and it's what, two and a half, three minutes long? Sure. Yeah, I think I think that would be great. But I'm yeah. I'm also happy to to speak about it as well. Okay. There's so much to it, but um. So we'll start high level. That, you know, Awaken Her is it's a female driven surreal psychological thriller, and it's set in the plastic surgery world. And um, it's about a woman who has this traumatic experience happen to her at a young age, and it shatters her self worth. And because of that, she hides her pain behind plastic surgery. And as she goes through life, she's really dealing with her internal demons and battling them and also running a plastic surgery medispa where she's selling these things to other women. Mm -hmm. And it's here that she meets these clients and starts to understand that perhaps they have a similar pain point than she does. And they start to exact vigilant justice against the client's abusers in the past in order to free themselves from this pain that they've been feeling. So it's a really fun ride, but we dig really deep into um, a lot of issues that women deal with around self-worth and and feeling that their self-worth is totally wrapped up into how they look. Mm-hmm. You know, your our interview here is coming on the heels of a, the, an interview I did about three days ago with uh, Julian Reeve, who was the musical director for Hamilton. And he was uh, he wrote a children's book on perfectionism. And he covered more the ground of um, athletes, musicians, and people in high pressure, uh, either artistic or corporate uh, positions, but never covered the aesthetic, never covered uh, the body canvas. And so I think that's amazing that uh, this conversation can be had by way of a good uh, 
intense drama? Is it is it a drama or is it, it it's, a, it's a sort of a you said a surreal psychological thriller? I think was the some of the yeah yeah there. it's it's a combination. There's drama, but it, we have that thriller aspect of it. It's very high paced and a lot of um, interesting reveals and that sort of thing that give it the thriller genre. Nice, nice. Um, so if you want, do you want to show the audience that uh, um, pitch video and then we can get back and, and then unpack things a little bit more? Absolutely. I think that's great. All right, cool. Just give me a second. We're going to have live TV here, uh, ladies and gentlemen who are with us on the interview. If I can get out of full screen here. All right. I cannot minimize Zoom. Oh, goodness. Well, I guess I can't do a share. Zoom's telling me I can't grab the video. Oh, wait, let me try one thing. I don't no, I'm not even going to try. Anyway, the pitch video is uh, it, it's informative in the sense, and I will have links to the, um, the 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 funding page that you have set up, and I want to talk about that particular uh, mode of of crowdfunding, but it's it's more dynamic, um, yeah. so people will have the ability to access the video, and I highly encourage them to do that because it really gives you a good. Uh, insight into what's going on. And and since we can't access it, I love the fact that you brought up Pedro Maldivar's uh, The Skin I Live In. I think that was one little snippet that you have because you, you know, Hollywood or, or European film uh, tends to portray uh, um, plastic surgery and things like that. And, it, it, you know, there are some of these films that get uh, get into that psych thriller kind of uh, vein. And it's been years since I saw that film, but I remember um, Antonio Banderas was a nasty character in that film. But yeah. yours is yours is uh, a little more of a broader story. And um, Yeah, well, I think that um, Hollywood tends to portray plastic surgery in a way that, um, well, it makes it like more of a comedy. You see a lot of comedies about it, people having like horrible outcomes or the horror aspect of it of people having horrible aspect, like outcomes but what i say in my pitch to, my pitch video is that i just don't feel like anybody really gets below the surface to really understand sometimes the trauma and the psychological um, component behind why somebody chooses to change the way they look and having said that i would like to say that i'm not against plastic surgery by any means i just feel that the why behind why people do things is really important to understand because if it's coming from a place of empowerment where somebody feels really good about who they are and they want to just enhance or have some fun with something else that's fine but it's when it comes from a place of that self-loathingness where you're expecting if you change something then all of a sudden you will feel more loved and you'll feel different it's it's a losing battle because it's a vicious cycle and you never really are able to fill that inner void. And, you know, I was really drawn to this material because, you know, as a young girl, I struggled so much with shame and um, I was ashamed of the way that I looked specifically. I always felt like I had a very big nose and, um, you know, coming from, you know, I, I had an Italian father and I felt like I was blessed with his Italian nose and my siblings were not. And it was something that I always felt a deep sense of like, I would look in magazines and I would never see myself in those magazines. And certain family members might make comments like, oh, you look just like your father and, and put it in ways that made me feel like that wasn't very good. So when you, as a young woman, when you have these feelings of insecurity, um, what can tend to happen is if any other traumatic incident happens, you will attribute that to the truth of why what you were feeling about yourself is actually true and you'll cement it and it'll mm -hmm. become your story. And so that's very similar to what happened to me. And so I ended up having um, a, a nose job. I had plastic surgery to change the way I looked. And then I felt a lot of shame around that because I was getting how could you change the way you looked? You know, this is the way God made you. And so it was this vicious, vicious perpetual shame cycle of feeling like this. And then lo and behold, I end up in this industry um, selling Botox to plastic surgeons and, and dermatologists. And it was here that I started to speak to so many different women and I realized that I was not alone with regards to this idea that so many women equate, again, the way that they look with their self-worth. And um, so it was around this time 
that I started to think, because I was acting always while I was doing this other job as well. And I started to think, well, this could be really interesting to share because I feel like so many women struggle with the same pain point that I struggle with. And I think it's worth exploring. And I think in the last, say, 15 or 20 years, that experience and that phenomena has gone beyond your industry. And it is um, pervasive in social media, where it is more of a democratized um, arena, where you have 12 and 13-year-old girls who are just posting to Instagram or whatever platform. And um, there's almost not quite an equal pressure because it's not coming from top down. It's sort of a you know oblique pressure from their peers and so forth. So what you're doing and the salience that you're bringing to this situation, I think is, is timely and it's essential because, and, and again, I hope that some of the uh, viewing audience that sees this video will reference this video to, uh, to tweeners and adolescent girls and, and boys that, uh, you know, they're feeling this tremendous amount of pressure, uh, even to the point of committing suicide, if they're not perfect, if they're not flawless and um you know what a dystopian horror to to, to yeah. craft and so you're coming in with a voice of reason and and this movie will uh be bringing again some, shedding some light into that otherwise uh, sure. shadowy nature that we're we're pulling out of ourselves right now right yeah and it's been like a very cathartic experience for me because i still remember where i was when i was um you know kind of having these epiphanies about stuff. And then I happened to watch a TED talk on Brene Brown and she was talking oh, yeah. about shame, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, she says it needs three ingredients to survive, you know, silence, secrecy, and judgment. And, mm. and I got that because I was so ashamed of the fact, I mean, I hadn't told people about what I had done to myself probably till like months ago, right? Because I thought, oh my God, like, I, that was something I wanted to hide no matter what. Like I, I didn't want people to think that I was flawed and that I, and I did these things. So it was around that time that I watched her talk and that I was also pregnant with my son. And so I wasn't able to go and audition and do the things like that. So I decided to take up the craft of screenwriting. And, you know, so this has been a cathartic journey for eight years of this script evolving. And, you know, having to teach myself to, to write, taking like the Robert McKee classes, the Saved by the Cats and getting involved into these writers groups where there was like nickel fellow that, like on there, like really, really good writers and having my butt handed to me over and over again, because, mm -hmm. you know, trying to learn something new sometimes can be painful. Yeah. But I really felt so driven because I wanted to share this story because I just felt like that this was a big part of my purpose. And I know, I knew again that like, if I had this pain point that others had this pain point and that you write about what you know, and that was a world that I lived in and I had experienced the pain of it. And so I, I felt like I wanted to be able to share that in like a really fun way um, through a film. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, in, in going down that path of becoming a screenwriter, I can really vision you, writing a book about, um, you know, less in the, in the narrative of a, a fictional teleplay and more in just your honest story. And also, you know, with a little research doing, uh, you know, what, again, young women and women coming of age uh, can do uh, to be more aware of how insidious this is, how it it's, uh, you know, it's a normative, it's part of our conversation now. And, and people, uh, you know, it's 30, 40 years ago, if a 12 year old wanted plastic surgery or a 15 year old, you know, everybody would look back and say, what is this? But now it's just, it's in the parlor, you know? And it's like, yeah. 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 So yeah. I, I, you know, if, if we're, it, it, you know, if I, uh, I, I'm always trying to think of, you know, new ideas and I just see you writing it. You could write a really good book about that and, uh, and platform the issue that way as well. Um, on top of, being a successful director in this film that's coming out. Like, yeah, that, you no. like that visioning process there? <laughs> I like that, there's, there's always more to come. And it's funny that you're, you know, you're saying that because I wouldn't be able to share the story until like I've come out on the other side of things because I think that's really important to be able to process it so that when other people are um, resonating with you, it's not from this lower energy part, but it's from a place of possibility and being able to inspire others. And my biggest epiphany through this whole thing was 
was when I got involved with meditation. And Mm -hmm. I really started to understand that these bodies, they're just our costumes, right? And that it's the spirit inside of us that illuminates those costumes. And I think that that to me was everything because I knew that like, if I started from that place, it didn't really matter what decisions I made. I wanted to change the way I look fine, whatever. It wouldn't have been coming from this self-loathing place versus like, no, like when you know who you are really, then all of a sudden things start to open up. And that's another, you know, really strong point that I think so many women struggle with is again, that all of our identity and I get it. Like society is constantly throwing things at our, at women specifically. Like if you don't look like this, if you're not this weight, or if you, you know, all these things, then you're not enough on, um, but that's again, just tying everything to the outside of us. And we're so much more than that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you had commented to uh, Christian Andrew in, in your con interview with him and your dialogue rather, uh, that the limited belief is the lens through which we see the world. And so we could invert that, uh, having you having said what you just said. And so unlimited uh, belief is the lens that you can see through the world. And so mindfulness uh, is a wonderful way in meditation, as you said, to, uh, to, to, to bring that in. Uh, you know, to a little bit more of a convergent focus and, and see that, um, you know, it's a, there is a binary system there, that there's the limited belief, but there's also the unlimited belief. And, and again, I used the word Imagineer earlier, and it, you know, with Disney and all that. And that's where all the greatest ideas have ever sprung. They, they've come from deep abstraction where there's nothing, uh, you know, like Bill Gates and, and all these guys that come up with stuff that, you know, didn't exist exist rather 60 years ago or 80 years ago. So um, there's a well there, a, a wellspring uh, of creativity. And you talk about, um, you know, the characters we play and who better than an accomplished actress to understand the persona and the mask that we wear when we go out of the house and the story we convince ourselves that we are and the narrative that we contrive. I think as an actor, you've got that covered so well in your salience. Uh, as a matter of fact, filmmaking overall is such a metaphor for life. Like you've got continuity, you've got production, <laughs> you've got the people who are who are paying attention to dialogue. Uh, it's a metaphor that I use when I, because uh, I casually, you know, mentor people and I say, you know, think of yourself in three parts. You're the actor on the stage, you're the audience, and you're the producer, and at, at all at once. And and don't be don't get so method in your acting that you don't you lose yourself. And also don't be too much of a producer that you're over controlling. And and just be at times the audience, and just know that whatever's going on in your in your landscape is the drama, the play of life. And so again, you as an actress have such a beautiful insight into. Um, into the personas and the and the masks that we wear. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, being an actor, one of my favorite things is is that you really have a strong sense of empathy because you're required to put yourself in other people's shoes and really see how you would be in those different circumstances. And to me, that's so fun and that's so exciting and um, never boring. Right. <laughs> Right, yeah. absolutely. And you know, I want to get into WeFunder in a moment, but I, I'll, one, one thought I had in, in researching what you're doing is, uh, my wife told me about um, a, a new book that Justine uh, Bateman had just put out. It's called Face, One Square Foot of Skin, right? So she is uh, bucking the trend and she and, um, oh, is it uh, Paulina Porzakova uh, and a few other women are like, guess what? I, I don't care, you know, what these comments are on, on whatever social media platform. And I just love that, that, um, so you're, yeah. you're, you're part of a renaissance in bringing to light the body shaming, the, the, the image shaming. And, you know, I'm, I, I, I tend to get very draconian when I see this kind of, um, commentary. And I think a person can qualify to look at you or myself and say, you know, your nose isn't right. Your hair isn't right. Your face doesn't, only if they register as a, a licensed critic and they have to get a, a full body shot of them, a picture of them with nothing but underwear on, a close up of their face, and they have to have it on a database where people can go and comment on how they look. If, right. if somebody's willing to do that, then you can look at me and criticize. But you know, these people are so anonymous, just like everything else on social media, there's anonymity, it shields you, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, though, Justin, like that's the message that I want this film to deliver to women is that your self-worth, it belongs to you and only you, like you get to decide. And it's so funny. I'm not sure if Alicia Keys is a part of the movement you're talking about, but I read an article about her and it always stuck with me because she started to do this, I'm not wearing makeup type of a thing, right? And then I guess she was doing a show with Adam Levine, right, from Burn 5. And he walked into her dressing room and saw Alicia putting on like lip gloss. And he was like, yo, Alicia, you know, I thought you were doing the thing. And she turned around to him. And can I swear on the show? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, 15 and over, leave the room. Or 15 and under, leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> Sa Sailor talks fine. You're good. So go ahead. She, says, she turns to him and she says, I do what the fuck I want. Yeah. And that's just it, though. But yeah. that's. Justin, that's like, we get to decide. And as long as it's coming from a empowered place from inside, then we get to have, we get to be the ones that write the rules. And it's not society telling us, it's not our mother, our friends or judgments and all those things. Like it's taking that power back and feeling empowered to be and to show up in this world in our costumes, the way we want to show up, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so cruel and so, surreal you know like the film you're you're developing that we live in a culture and we can open up patriarchy here a little bit like men are on a whole nother page i know you know okay so i'll i'll list off a couple of man complaints you know like we're we're judged for our hair our height and certain genitalian dimensions and things like that but really i we don't get ripped to shreds because an eyelash is out or our you know so so it's a different dynamic but um you know, this this is again. It's a top down in your industry where the the mostly male uh, 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 money and power people are saying, oh, you know, you don't look twenty three and you're not five ten and you're not stacked and you're not skinny and yada 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 and yep. and that and then again, there's the age line and that's what Justine Bateman was sort of presenting. It's like and it can she basically like Alicia Keys said, fuck you, I don't care. Yeah. Uh, and and that is such empowerment. That, and, and if anybody is watching this and they need inspiration, of course, Awaken Her will be coming out sh shortly. And also, you know, go check out Justine Bateman and, and, and other women who are empowered. Um, again, that uh, Paulina, and I always butcher her name, Porza Kova. She looks so much like Lauren Bacall now. She's probably my age. I'm early 50s. She's probably a couple years old. But God, she looks so much like Lauren Bacall. And who more wouldn't you want to look like? You know, because Lauren aged and she didn't, uh, you know, she didn't do any anything too crazy for herself but she was gorgeous into her 90s right yeah no absolutely and I love that you brought that patriarchal foes up because that's definitely in the film as well because you know being a woman there's this different sense of power that we a lot of times don't have in certain situations or we feel based on what society has said like we have to act in certain ways because certain people have power and that power usually like you mentioned before self-worth with men isn't necessarily tied into like or held to the standard of women of the way they look it's more about like how successful are you like how much money do you have how well are you a good provider right because you can be the ugliest guy in the world but have the most you know, beautiful wife and all that stuff. And then it's more about, it's something different, right? Yeah. So I think even like the Harvey Weinstein thing and that abuse of power of, you know, when you hold the keys to the kingdom and, and, and you feel like as a woman that you've been told that you have to act certain ways in different circumstances in order to get access to the things you want. It's also really tricky. And it also plays into these different stereotypes of, oh, I need to play the, I'm the delicate, pretty girl and I need to be you know like this with you so that you will give me opportunity and I feel like right now in this time and age that's all getting flipped around mm -hmm. and women are now getting it's still there's still a lot that needs to happen but there's more talks about equality more talks around um this sharing of power versus this from the top down type of a mentality so I'm really excited about that and I do feel like the timeliness of this film is perfect and it's and it's going to resonate with a lot of women um and i'm really excited to get it out there absolutely absolutely and um and i do want to unpack some of that before i know you're uh, you're on a uh, tight schedule today because you have lots of interviews which is awesome and i'm so, again grateful that you were able to get in with me for a little bit um the uh the objectification i i've thought about this before and it seems like objectification 
ethically is scalable. And that sounds weird, but like, so if I'm, and I'm married now, so I don't think this way anymore, but like when I was attracted to my partner, um, I had to objectify that person to a degree. I had to say, well, you know, she's five, seven, she's a brunette. She's got a, you know, pale skin and a face or whatever it was I was. So there's a certain uh, salience thing that goes on in objectification. And I think that's part of our hardwired, you know, evolutionary system. But then when that scales out into a cultural or a social level, and that's what you were talking about, then it comes, it becomes bullshit because, um, you know, to see a woman as an object or a commodity in your industry, and that some of that has to exist. Like if you're a musician, you're a commodity. If you're an actor or an actress, you're a commodity. But to over fetishize that commodification, you know, to get Marxist for a minute, if we, if we overdo that, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, you're just part of an, it's like, you're a soldier in the army. You're just a serial number in an inventory of, of weapons and stores and things like that. And I, you know, I, there's got to be a limit to that dehumanizing and objectifying uh, uh, accepted norm that we have in our culture. And again, what you're doing and what all the other uh, women are doing who have some salience and some power to, uh, to get out and deliver a message to younger people. And fortunately, you, I think you hit it on the head earlier that young folks like the millennial generation under 35, under 40, uh, and, and, and what are they, Zoomers or whatever they call the younger ones, uh, aren't putting up with that crap as much. Now, there's a whole lot of that same, uh, you know, it's like a duality. There's a lot of people dealing with image issues, but I think on the larger meta scale, these people of that generation um, are being more aware of, of social issues like race and misogyny and things like that. So I'm hoping <laughs> <laughs> that as they mature and move through and get more empowered in business and in politics, that we'll see some shifts and we'll see some, yeah. and, and in social contracts too, and just how we see things. Because honestly, I, it's, it just disgusts me that, that, uh, you know, ads like advertising, I, I don't watch a lot of television anymore. I think I have um, Hulu or whatever that is. And I, I get a little, but it's always these young girls selling, you know, whatever product it is, dishwashing soap to, you know, yeah. I'm just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> You're just hijacking yeah. my, my senses here. And, and it's both men. And, and so, you know, come on. Well, yeah. I mean, I grew up and, um, you know, watching films that were made by men, most people who are going to watch this and even the younger generation, because let me tell you only five to 8% of the films that we see are made by men and directed by men. And so what that means is you're seeing it through the lens of how men see the world and how men see women in their world. So as a woman, you are subconsciously pre-programmed at a young age when you start watching these films to see how, how do I fit into this world and how do I show up in this world through a male gaze? And that's why it's so important to start telling more um, stories through the female gaze. And like, I commend like people like Reese Witherspoon, who's got a company like Hello Sunshine and, and is really telling more stories through the female gaze and stories about women that we want to see, we want to relate to. So I think it's really important that that shift happens as well, that we have more female directors, female writers telling the stories that haven't been told anymore. Um, so yeah, and I mean, kudos to Reese Witherspoon for doing that, you know? Yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, we need to see that shift and uh and and have it happen organically right so you know there's a demand for it or there's an interest in it and again i i, I try to pretend i'm very egalitarian so if i know there's a female uh filmmaker like you doing something that's why we're here i i saw that and i said yeah we got to do that because uh awesome. you know every little bit we can do can make the make the shift occur uh, so uh, that's a perfect segue. Let's talk about WeFunder and let's get some information out about um, how people can become invested in what you're doing. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so WeFunder is a great platform. It's an equity crowdfunding platform, which is different than your traditional crowdfunding platforms. Okay. Um, crowdfunding is more like people are donating and they're, it's like your moms and your dads and your, your friends and they, they're doing it because they love you. Yeah. Um, Equity crowdfunding actually speaks to a lot of the changes that are happening with the rebalancing of power, because normally you would go to these accredited investors and they would invest quite large amounts into your, your project. But what equity crowdfunding does is it allows 
um, people to invest and actually have a stake in your project success for as little as $250. So it really gives people this opportunity to feel like they're a part of something bigger. And specifically like with a film like Awaken Her, being a part of a social impact film that has an opportunity to you know, change the narrative for women people get excited about that. It's like you're investing in the arts, you are um, supporting a social impact and, um, and then you're, you're in a community. You're, you're not just in this bubble. You're with other like-minded people who can communicate on the platform and, and share why they invested on, in it. And, and you feel very much like you're, you're on this team and you're, right. and you're bringing this thing because it's important to you as well and you're helping bring it to life. So it's really cool. Very nice, very nice. And that is so much more engaging than, again, like you were saying, where, oh, you know, just uh, flip her 50 bucks and, you know, best of luck. You know, you, you're, you're, you've got, as they say, skin in the game uh, for this kind of movie. Um, so, <laughs> right. <laughs> that could be one of your taglines. Get some skin in the Awaken Her game, right? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> some, of the like surgeon, some of the surgeon scraps, but in a good way. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that is just, uh, that's rich because, um, and, and, you know, the concept has been around, oh, you can be an executive producer because I love no budget and I love super independent, like, you know, like $50,000 budget films because I was on a film bender for about 15, about 12 to 15 years. And I, the, the smaller the film and the less known, it was like, oh, you know, you have a little gem in your hands. Uh, but, it, you know, in the meso scale, um, um, that translates into your having an opportunity to see something like your project really spring out. And I think you mentioned in an interview that you would be thrilled to uh, to work with Netflix as a, uh, a distribution. And Netflix is the cat's meow right now, right? Or it's been that way for years. And that's where I spent 12 or 15 years watching like 12 or 1400 films, you know, just eating yeah. it all up. Yeah. And, uh, and um, so I think that's a great avenue. So, you know, this is a very direct vision that, that uh, um, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't have any obfuscation or any kind of obstacles you know, yeah, get, and, get and we want Jennifer Garner to play the lead. So right? even though it's considered a low budget, um, we're also doing the diversity clause to make sure that we have diversification within our film too, because um, that's really important to me as well. Um, but it is, it's in the low budget um, and it's, it, we want to attract, you know, A-list talent to this project because that's how we're going to reach the most hearts and the most minds um, with this with this film and the ideas behind it. So, you know, the goal is we're gonna make a great product and then, you know, selling it to a distributor like Netflix and, you know, being um, involved hopefully in some film festivals like Sundance. Um, our line producer is has a fantastic track record of past projects at Sundance. So we're really excited about the different potentials and the relationships that we have within the industry that we can leverage. Mm -hmm. um, but our goal is to get this out to as many people so that we can inspire as many people and and get this message out to people and in a really fun, exciting, thriller-esque way, you know? So, right, right. so yeah, we're really excited about that. Absolutely. Um, oh gosh, what just came into my head a second ago? Um, you know, when you say the word low budget and for the audience that's watching this, you know, don't let that, that's, you know, I there are some incredible um, independent films and, and smaller production number films that have some huge uh, talent in them. You know, the big big names. I remember there was a um, there was a film with Will Ferrell in it, and he was not being the the dopey clown that he normally is. It was a very deep dark uh, drama, and it probably you know it was probably three four hundred thousand dollar budget. And 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 there's a bunch of other films that I, I I wouldn't be able to pull up the actors, but just names you know, and they're in these tiny little films. Uh, yeah. you know, and Amy Adams got started that way. She was in some incredible indies and then she blew up. She, I forget what film launched her out into that, you know, sort of yeah. analyst or thing a few years ago. But I mean, there's, there's, uh, big names in films that don't have the $40 million CGI orgy budgets and stuff like that. Well, uh, the other thing too, is like our budget is very, if you go to wefunder.com and you look up Awaken Her, you're able to access through my investor pitch deck, our budget. So our budget is just under $3 million. Okay. So that's still considered low budget in the, mm -hmm. the sad world. Um, but I love that also about WeFunder is because things are transparent. You get to see where we're spending money right now. And as we hit milestones, so like I will put out like a message, hey, we're, we're looking at our casting portion of the budget and we need to hit 
$270,000, help us get there. And then people can, can get behind that and you can really tackle the budget in pieces, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in one of your interviews from about a month ago, you said April 30th was a deadline for something. Is, was that something I misheard? Uh, is there something happening today? Uh, this is being filmed on the 30th for those watching. Yeah, was there yeah. anything about that or? No, I, I don't remember uh, exactly that. No, we're going, we're planning on shooting this project in July. Okay. So we're looking to, you know, raise the, the funds for this project before then. Um, and that's like our direction. That's what everything in our budget is, is geared towards and getting our cast on board. Um, but yeah, so you, there's still opportunity right now to come in and to invest and be a part of the vision and, and be a part of the Awaken Heart team. And you can okay. go to um, WeFunder to do that. Okay. And I know you just hit 200K uh, recently in the last few days, I think. And that's, um, that's awesome. That's a milestone. So as far as this um, outsourced funding, uh, what is, I think your next goal was 270, I think. Yeah. About okay. Yeah. All right. So what's the, the overall um, on the um, sort of public buy-in? Is there, so do you have, does that have to be matched or will that be something that will be matched uh, by other investors slash producers or because yeah. I, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. No, that's such a great question. I'm happy to, to break that down. Um, the way it works is where you shoot your film, we're going to shoot in New York and New Jersey. There's tax credits mm. that you get for shooting there. And so what your line producer will do is they'll file for a tax credit before you even start shooting so that that money is coming to you. Right. And so we have about around eight hundred thousand dollars in tax credits. Right. So you take that off of the budget and then you also will factor in different things with regards to when you get talent attached, doing like pre-sales to different um, different markets across the world. Um, so those are more of like your soft money type of uh, funds. So mm -hmm. on WeFunder, we're looking to raise one point five million dollars on that okay. platform. And we have till July to do that. All right. So if you're watching this interview and there's going to be soup to nuts people out there watching, I want to encourage you again to go to WeFunder or you can just type Awaken Her Film and in Google and it'll pull that up. Or you can go to Carrie Lynn Miller and that's all going to be down below in the description field. And, um, you know, from my heart, I encourage you to just give it a look. Uh, you know, and if you have two hundred and fifty dollars, you can get, again, a little uh, skin in that game of the skin game. And, uh, and see where this goes, because I think, you, you know, if you have daughters, if you have sisters, if you have anybody uh, who is affected by this toxic uh, and, and uh, whatever you want to call it, I ideology of uh, perfection and, uh, you know, what the female should look like, I, I, I would love to see a world where we can, you know, take care of ourselves, have, have good hygiene and things like that, but you can be dead honest about who you are. Nobody's going to go, you know, uh, point their finger at you and, and berate you for being what, you know, the universe made you to be. So, um, you know. absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, Justin, also, um, I just want to share that there's some really fun perks on there for yeah. our investors everything from like, you know, a special thanks on the credit when like the credits roll to becoming a, an executive producer on the project to having a, a walk on role on the project okay. to having your project reviewed by our team. Um, if you're somebody that wants to get into the industry um, or if you have a kid that wants to get into the industry, we have something where, you know, they can break in and there's a small role for them as well. So a lot of fun stuff. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, if I invest, I would love to go up to your location and just roll cable or hand out water. You know, I just, I love film so much that even just, even being a part of that sort of uh, volunteer slash intern level of just doing Monday, but just being in that energy and that environment. Cause again, yeah. I love film. And my favorite part about movies is at the end of a, a DVD, they have the sort of uh, insights into production or that's the, the production reel or whatever you want, the making of story. And, and some of them are done so well because they give you so much uh, insight into what's going on in the end. And, you know, we go to see a movie and we don't think about the 10 trillion things that have to happen for a movie to really right. gel. So anyway, right. Well, I know you've got an interview coming up and I, I am again grateful for the time that we had together and I want to bring you back. I want to do an update so and we can just do little vignettes as this progresses. Uh, and that might be a really interesting uh, uh, story, uh, you know, uh, uh, how it developed kind of uh, retrospective. Right? People can come back and watch this when your film is doing really well. I love uh, it. I love soaring. it. I'm so, so grateful to be here. Yes.
Yes. So I will, uh, I'll stay in touch with you and uh, we'll see if we can get you back uh, when, when news breaks happen and things, uh, you know, uh, the emergence process uh, unfolds. So, so Carrie Lynn Miller, it's been an honor and, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to do my little teeny part right here to help uh, again, bring some salience to this and, and get it out there. Um, and again, all relevant information for the film and for, uh, for Carrie Lynn Miller, we'll make sure that you have access to her website will be available in the description field. So, and those of you watching, again, if you have a uh, family that's uh, struggling with these kind of things, have them check this out and, uh, and, and send them the link to this video. And, and, and also if you know people who would like to get in and be that little micro executive producer, show them this and for 250 bucks and i know we're in COVID, and i know we got stuff going on and some people don't have the deep pockets but you know, if this is something that's that's a passion for you film and so forth uh check it out so again carrie lynn did you have anything else to to close with before we um, say goodbye? i was just thinking i just um we shot two scenes from the film as a proof of concept and i'd love to share for your listeners um we created a little trailer for that like a 30 second trailer they can kind of give people a sneak peek into the tone and the, the feel and the vibe of it. Um, I think it could be fun and I'd love to share it with your followers. Okay, I'll get that link uh, and okay. we can ex we can put that again down below. So Great. awesome, awesome. Great conversation and uh, to be continued as they say, <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is part one of the saga. <laughs> I love it, to be continued, yes. <laughs> yes, all right. All right, this Carrie, I'll say goodbye to you after I stop recording and then uh, everyone who was watching, thank you for being here. And, uh, and take a little piece of this with you and uh, have a beautiful day. We'll talk to you later.